welcome to the Social Science Forum lecture by Bob Holmes on narrow leadership in the time of crisis. I'd like to thank the Maryland Institute for Policy Analysis and Research, the Sondheim Public Affairs Scholars Program, the Department of Public Policy, and the Department of Political Science. We're in for a treat today. Uh, Dr. Holmes retired in 2005 as Emeritus Distinguished Professor of Political Science at Clark Atlanta University, where he was also director of the Southern Center for Studies in Public Policy and the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute. He received his PhD in political science at the ripe old age of 25 from Columbia University. He served for 34 years as state representative in the Georgia legislature. In 1990, he was chair of the Legislative Black Caucus, which at that time had 35 members. And as uh, my co-author and I, Dr. Thomas Schaller, document in our book, Devolution in Black State Legislators, was the largest legislative black caucus at that time. He was the first African American to serve on the Budget Committee and the first to chair the Committee on Education. He successfully co-sponsored or sponsored more than 200 bills that actually became law instead of just proposing things that actually don't go anywhere. Uh, Professor Holmes serves as administrator and a faculty member at institutions like Columbia, Southern, and Hunter. He was on the executive council for the American Political Science Association, former president of the Association of Social and Behavioral Scientists, and the national president of the National Black Caucus of Black, State, uh, Black Political Scientists. Uh, as he indicated, we're going to talk about tonight a uh, gentleman by the name of John Wesley Dobbs, uh, who became a very important figure in his life, a role model, a mentor, and as Clarence Thomas said in his book, My Grandfather's Son, uh, he actually did serve in that capacity as a surrogate father because Maynard's dad died when he was only 14 years old, just as he was entering his freshman year in college. And when I was college, he was an early uh, scholar, and so uh, he was a very bright young man who skipped actually four grades out of the first 12 that he attended in the public schools. And then the other person was, in fact, his father. Uh, Reverend Maynard Jackson Sr., uh, an individual who had done a lot of things before he became, uh, you know, a minister of one of the uh, most renowned churches in the city of Atlanta, where the colleges of Spelman College and Morehouse College were actually founded. Uh, and he was also the head of the uh, Alumni Association and Development, but he was also a businessman. He was a businessman who engaged in import-export at a very young age, uh, when uh, he was dealing with African nations uh, and uh, those who were still colonies, but he was trying to work with them and work with, of course, some of the colonial powers in Africa in order to uh, enhance the uh, economic uh, foundation of those particular uh, you know, uh, nations. But I say this to say that uh, all of us are indelibly uh, imprinted with the values of our uh, friends, our relatives, and particularly our parents. And this was particularly true in the case of Maynard Jackson. Uh, he was known as a trailblazer, of course, uh, someone who paved the road for others. But his father and grandfather were equally renowned in that capacity. His father, Maynard Jackson Sr., for example, was the first African American to run for the school board after the uh, Smith versus Allwright decision in 1944 in Texas, which outlawed the white primary. He then, in fact, uh, ran for the school board. Uh, there were mobs who came to his house and his uh, his then church members came with their shotguns and their rifles to, in fact, protect him. Uh, he founded the Dallas uh, Business, the Negro Business League. He helped to, uh, after, after that particular case, uh, he began to register and set up the, uh, uh, you know, the Dallas Voter Registration League and a number of those things. And as I said previously, he engaged in business practices. Uh, his dad, his grandfather, uh, uh, Mr. John Wesley Dobbs, was known as the mayor of Auburn Avenue. He was an individual who was concerned about and involved in higher education. He went to Morehouse College, where his grandson Maynard uh, also went. He was one of the people who helped to organize several businesses. And he was known as the mayor of Auburn Avenue, which was the core of businesses among the black community uh, during that particular period of time. More importantly, he was also the leader of the Prince Hall Masons, the black uh, Masons. And in that capacity, did a number of things such as giving the NACP $50,000 to help win the Brown versus Board of Education case and to do a number of other things. But he was also involved in voter registration. And Maynard's grandfather and father said that there were three primary elements in enhancing the livelihood 
enhancing the economic well-being uh, and enhancing the formal education of African American people so they could, in fact, uh, improve the quality of life throughout. He said there were the three Bs. Mr. Dobbs coined this phrase, but his uh, son-in-law uh, also believed in them as well. He said there is a ballot, there's a book, and there's a buck. The ballot is, of course, obvious. As I said, both of them engaged. Mr. John Wesley Dobbs was one of the co-founders of the Atlanta Negro Voters League. It was a few years later in 1947 when the Primus King case in Georgia, in which you know how the Supreme Court operates, it is continuing to uh, have to deal with the same issues in different states. So in 44, Smith versus Allwright, white primary eliminated in Texas. In 1947, Primus King case, white primary uh, you know, eliminated in Georgia. And at that time, blacks could begin to play a role in the political process. I think most of you are aware of the fact of the history of the South in terms of the Democrats, you know, being the party of race and slavery, the Republicans, of course, being the party of freeing the slaves and of Lincoln, and, but the same thing was true as related to the white primary in the South. Didn't matter which state you lived in, of course, if only white people vote in the primary, they have already selected the candidate who's gonna win the general election. So if you excluded blacks from them, and like the Jaybird party in Texas, then you, in effect, uh, eliminated, eliminated their particular ability to impact the general election process. So because the person who won the process of the Democratic primary would in fact be the one who would be elected governor, mayor, or whatever it might be. So this was the kind of situation that they recognized, and they both were instrumental. Maynard Jackson was also interested in voter registration. He established the 23 county uh, voter registration league. At the end of his life, he was actually still dealing with that. He established the American Voters League, all of which he felt were designed, of course, to get blacks involved in the political process. First thing you had to do was, in fact, to what? Get people registered to vote. And then you, of course, had to go out and recruit and organize and mobilize and get black candidates uh, elected. And while they were registered, of course, they could influence you know, the uh, white elected officials. And of course, they could actually make policy if they were in office as well. So the ballot was a very important thing. Education, the buck, was also another important thing. Uh, Mr. Dobbs was a voracious leader, a reader. Uh, he worked, he had to drop out of school to help his mother to take care of his, uh, his siblings uh, because uh, his father had died in, at an early age and he actually had to drop out of college. But he met many intellectuals at Lane University, at Fisk University, uh, and things of that nature. And he read and he made his six daughters also read. And all six of them were, uh, were in fact uh, honors graduates of Spelman uh, College. And he imbued these values of education in, of course, uh, Maynard. Maynard's father was the head, as I said, of alumni affairs and direct, director of development at Morehouse College. Uh, and uh, Maynard went there and he graduated from there. But the idea was that you need to make sure, and Maynard's uh, interest in higher education uh, developed to such a point that he actually served on the board of trustees of four of the colleges and universities in the Atlanta, U Atlanta University Center. You know, Morehouse College, Spelman College, uh, Atlanta University Graduate School, and Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, which is something I don't know of anyone who's ever served on, and they're all right there in the Atlanta University uh, Consortium. So education was, in fact, a very important. And the last thing, of course, was the book, or business. I indicated Mr. Dobbs was instrumental in the establishment of major black businesses like Mutual Federal Savings and Loan, uh, Atlanta Life Insurance Company, and a number of others that, in fact, uh, were the core of the Black uh, Economic Foundation uh, in Atlanta. And Maynard also saw this as something that was very significant, and I'll talk about this in a little more detail when we talk about his role in the so-called joint venture project, which uh, helped to uh, enhance black business development by getting contracts with city and other you know, governments, in particular the city project, dealing with the half a billion dollar airport uh, expansion. So the idea was that you needed to, in fact, build this foundation, and they were really inextricably intertwined. That is, the, uh, the book, the ballot, and the buck. And one of the things that Maynard did to ensure that economic development and quality of life would be improved was to, in fact, try to stimulate black uh, business development. And you know that's kind of an overarching uh, thing about those three things, and as I will point out, he basically spent most of his public service trying to deal with those particular issues and was somewhat
very successful uh, in that regard. Getting back, uh, you know, a few years, uh, Maynard went to law school. He had this decision, am I going to be an attorney? Am I going to be a minister? There were a bunch of both in his family. And he finally decided on being uh, an attorney. He went up to Boston University when he was 18 years old, getting ready to go to law school. And he was somewhat distracted. Uh, by things, being away from home for the first time. Yes, he skipped four grades, two grades in elementary school and two grades in high school, and he was selected as one of a handful of early entry scholars by the Ford Foundation. They paid all year. It's kind of like the Bill and Melinda Gates scholarship now, uh, that they pay for everything, all of your expenses are what you can concentrate on academics. So the thing here was that when he made this decision, it sort of began you know, his professional, you know, career. He didn't do a good job at Boston. He was, in fact, distracted. He did, in fact, drop out. And then he became a salesman for an encyclopedia company and ended up being regional manager three years later. I mean, that's how good he was. I mean, they say he could, what, talk the uh, raccoons out of the trees or whatever kinds of things you do there. Very difficult. But when he did finish law school at North Carolina Central University, where his mother was the chairman of the French department there, uh, he in fact decided to come back to Atlanta. He worked first for the National Labor Relations Board, and then he set up this neighborhood law center because he felt there were a lot of indigent minority people who in fact were unable to get adequate uh, you know, legal assistance when they were accused of crimes. So that was what drove him. Again, the beginning of his public service drove him to get into that particular area. And then a couple of things happened in his life which really shifted him over to his political career, which he then became involved in for about 35 years, you know, off and on at different levels, both elected politics, as well as, of course, uh, you know, uh, politics in terms of the Democratic National Committee, National League of Cities, and things of that nature. What happened, basically, was that within a two-month period, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated and Dr. Martin Luther King were assassinated. And there was a guy named Herman Talmadge, uh, and as you probably know, the Herman, the Talmadge family literally ran politics. You know, they were governors, they were uh, senators, they were congressmen. You know, it was kind of like the good old boy network of the Talmadge uh, family. And Talmadge, of course, hadn't had any opposition for two six-year terms. And Maynard, at the ripe old age of, of uh, 30, decided he would run against him and just qualify. You know, congressmen are 25 and they're eligible, senators are 30. He decided to run against Talmadge. They said, you must be out of your mind. You know, no one can beat a Talmadge in any, any election uh, in Georgia. Well, they were right in that part, but he made a very good showing. He went, he had a, uh, a kind of a message, which was that we needed to have a coalition of poor people, of white people, of mixed you know, race people, of gays, a, a whole, and, and people who are concerned about changing Georgia politics in particular, and the nature of the Georgia, uh, you know, social uh, arena uh, in general. And so he set out and spent about six months campaigning throughout the state, and uh, he did lose the election, as predicted, but something happened. You know, he won while he lost. He got more votes in the city of Atlanta than did Talmadge. And you can imagine what that meant to the people who were supporting him, that that meant he had a, what, a career in Atlanta politics. And so the next year, 1969, this was 1968, he in fact decided to run for vice mayor. And because of his boldness, some say called a lot of other things, uh, he, running against Talmadge and making that showing, he was kind of the, by acclamation, the candidate who in fact would run for vice mayor that the African-American community and progressive whites would, in fact, support. So he did run, and he did, in fact, win at his first try for office. When he came into office as vice mayor, you know, in 1970, he elected in 1969, one of the first things he realized was the great disparities which existed. When you think of civil rights, the, the, uh, the, the, the employment, the job situation in city government, he found what he thought was really an atrocious situation. You know, into the police department, for example, you only had a handful of people who were above, you know, the rank of patrolmen, okay? In terms of city agencies, there were no African Americans and no women who headed not only any of the, the, the agencies in city government, but were barely 
a handful of them, only barely a handful of them, in the middle level management, not none in, of course, uh, of the top management. Uh, you had a situation that he discovered there were also great disparities in terms of black businesses doing business with, you know, with the city, city government and being able to, you know, make money since they paid taxes, his idea was, well, they should also be eligible for, you know, doing projects in construction and services and things of that particular nature. And he just sort of got the tip of the iceberg and he wanted to sort of build coalitions and the guy that he was working with was a gentleman by the name of Sam Massell who was elected in 1969 as mayor at the same time. Well, as Maynard's popularity grew, Sam Massell, of course, viewed him as a potential rival. And initially, because Sam Massell was elected with 92% of the African American vote, he in fact felt that he needed to you know, give some, uh, something back to his supporters. And he did in fact set up, uh, there were five African Americans on the city council. And he decided that he would appoint you know, a couple of them chairman of committees. He would also appoint uh, three person committees. So that way, the mayor was an ex official voting member and so was the uh, vice mayor so that Maynard could actually play a role in influencing policy because if he could get one ally among the three member committees, then he could either pass legislation or if he allied, uh, sided with uh, the black member, they could block bad legislation. But as I said, as Marcel became more concerned about his rival and potential opponent in the 73 election, he did some things, I just mentioned one, but there are several others we can read about in the book. Uh, the first most important thing uh, was the fact that he became so concerned that he asked the legislature to annex an unincorporated area of the county known as Sandy Springs to annex it to the city of Atlanta. Sandy Springs, some of us older members in here remember the commercial about Ivory Snow, 99 and 44, 100%. Well, that was the demographic makeup of Sandy Springs. So by bringing Sandy Springs, which was 99 and 44, 100% white, into the city, he could assure himself being reelected. The only thing was that the legislature, the local uh, legislative delegation in Atlanta, Fulton County objected, and one of the allies was a gentleman, well, I don't know what it is, less dramatic, but for a completely different reason, you heard of less dramatic. So when the cell did that, that was like throwing down the gauntlet, and Maynard decided to, in fact, run against him. Michelle and it was, was yeah, Sam Michelle Michelle. was white, correct? Yes. Well, he was Jewish. Okay. He was, yeah. Uh, Sam Michelle. And his daddy owned a lot of real estate. Well, all of the mayors, as you probably know, were businessmen, you know, in Atlanta. You know, Ivan Allen owned Ivan Allen the company. Marcel was in, uh, you know, real estate development. Mayor Hartsfield, the airport was named after. The city government was, in fact, an extension of the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, they were one and the same. You know, those leaders and advisors and people who were in the kitchen cap and everything were businessmen, which isn't really unusual. You always surround yourself with people who are somewhat like you. So that's, that's not unusual to happen. So what happened was that this set up you know, the, the, the necessary uh, situation so that there was a battle between those two and to shorten things, Maynard actually won that battle. And then he realized that he was in a position, it's almost like what is be careful what you wish for, when you get there you may not actually want it. And this brings us to the sort of crisis part of it and the fact that I think he could be said to be an outstanding role model in terms of dealing with many of these kinds of issues that we still are confronted with but he made great inroads into solving many of these problems in the city of Atlanta. He came into office under a new charter. The previous charter was, in fact, uh, a weak mayor form of government. The chairman of the various council committees, like if you were chairman of public safety, you basically ran the police department. If you were chairman of public works, you know, you had responsibility for wastewater, sewer, and everything. You know, if you were chairman of the environment, you basically, you know, selected the commission. And that's the way it was. In other words, the cabinet, like most of us think of most governments at all levels, the gubernatorial, you know, you select your cabinet. You know, Georgia is unlike that. Uh, Georgia elects everyone. It elects judges, it elects superintendents of education, it elects commissioners of agriculture, and everybody in Georgia. So the governor in Georgia really doesn't have a cabinet. Well, that's the way the city of Atlanta government was. They were elected directly by the people. You know, municipal court judges, superior court judges, Supreme Court judges, appeals court, everyone was elected, is elected in Georgia. That's still the case for the most part. So the bottom line here was that if he had been elected under the old system, he would have had very little power. So under the new system, it meant what he had to, in fact, put together his team. But he did, in fact, decide to keep some of them. But he first had to, had to change city government structure. 
one of the mandates under the 1973 city charter was to reorganize city government. They had 27 different agencies and a bloated bureaucracy, and it was inefficient and, in fact, uh, you know, ineffective. So the first thing you had to do was to recruit some of the best and brightest folk, black and white, to come in to take over those agencies, to kick out the good old boy network, and to, in fact, do those things that needed to be done in order to make government even more responsive to the citizenry, but more important, to integrate that and to have a diverse you know, city government uh, in terms of managers and in terms of uh, judges and, and, and everything else to try to get them in place so that he could deal with some of those problems. Well, what were some of the problems that he, in fact, recognized that he had to deal with? Well, the first problem that he saw was an issue related to the buck. The buck was that African Americans were not getting any of it. Well, I shouldn't say not any of it. They had 0.0012% of city business under contract. Zero point, no, 0.0012% uh, of all of the contracts, you know, services, construction, you know, building city hall east, uh, building recreation centers, you name it, you know, getting supplies from, you know, office supply papers and whatever. That was all it was. So he decided that there was something that needed to be done about this. He came up with a concept called joint venture. Well, it's been called a lot of other things, uh, some not so nice, but the bottom line was he was saying that since you've had 99.8%, one, two, one, yeah, 8% of, eight, eight percent of the contracting, you're gonna have to give up, you know, some of this. And the white business community was, of course, reluctant to do that. He came up with numbers like, you know, 25 percent, you know, how does that sound, or 30 percent or something like that, trying to negotiate uh, with them, but they said, we're happy with what we got, 99 percent, natural. So the bottom line was, in this case, he said, well, we got this airport, you know, that's going to cost a half a billion dollars to build. I will let grass grow on that site if you don't come around on that. You will get zero percent of the contract because the airport simply won't be built. So it's your choice. Uh, you know, he was called hard-headed, which was right. But in some instances, as he said, you had to be a bull in the china shop in order to get things through because people were so, you know, uh, used to the good old boy network. Because what they used to do was the purchasing department didn't even have competitive bidding. I mean, doesn't that sound strange? Competitive bidding. So what they did, they would call up tailor contractors and say, hey, you know, we got a project coming up and uh, you just need to submit a bid, we're going to give this bid to you next time to build this new uh, facility in this park, you know, in Buckhead. And then the next time they'd call uh, Walker Construction and say, well, you know, we're going to build City Hall East and it's probably going to cost maybe 30, 35 million. Why don't you, in fact, you know, give us your bid, we're going to give it to you. With regard to the banks, he said to trust company, you know, which is the local base bank and uh, citizens in Southern Bank, First Atlanta Bank, he would call one up. You know when you pay your property taxes, right? You know, you get tens of millions of dollars in in a short period of time, and you don't spend that money. You know, you spend it throughout the year, right? You know, your budget goes. But you get maybe $40, $50 million in property taxes. So one year, they give it to First Atlanta. The next year, they give it to uh, Citizens and Southern. The next year, they give it to Trust Company. And Maynard said, whoa. What about mutual federal savings and loans? What about uh, Citizens Trust? These were black banks. He said they're not in the rotation. <laughs> in other words, they don't get it, just like the same thing with the construction. You didn't have Russell, Herman Russell Construction. You didn't have Mitchell Construction, gentlemen who had been in business for decades. Their daddies were in business before them, but they didn't get one penny out of it. I think that 0.0012% were bill buying some copy paper, some cash registers, and things like that. I think they got it from Brown Office Supply because, I mean, obviously, if they got in any building, you know, built by a contractor, it was just, just zero. So he said, no, we're going to have to change this kind of situation. He so told the bankers, he said, look, uh, we will put our money not only in black banks in Atlanta, but we will put money in Charlotte banks, in Birmingham banks, if you guys don't come along. And he said, I'm really serious. And so you can imagine this really got on these folks' nerves because they fought him nail and tooth, uh, you know, all the way until they finally agreed. You know, contractors, uh, architects, uh, engineering, they said the same thing. The bankers said, well, you know why we don't have any African Americans on the board? He said, well, we can't find any who are qualified. Mm -hmm. And of course, Maynard, 
Well, he couldn't jump because he weighed about 300 pounds, but the bottom line was he said, you've heard of a guy named Dr. Ed Irons? He used to be the commissioner of banking of the District of Columbia in D.C. He's the dean of the School of Business now. He has a chair in money and banking you know, from the uh, Citizens and Southern Bank. You don't think he's qualified to be on the bank board? He probably knows more about banking than you do, Mr. President, of the bank. And he probably did, because Ed had been not only a banker, but also, as I said, ran a banking system, basically. So this kind of thing is what he ran into. But he saw this as a vehicle, a mechanism to, in fact, allow black businesses to, in fact, play a role and to use city contracting as a mechanism to, in fact, uh, enhance black economic development. And uh, blacks ended up uh, not only uh, being involved in about 30% of the contracting that was done on the airport, but the airport was built on time and, of course, uh, at cost. In other words, there was no cost overruns. That's what the thing they were saying, the architects and engineering, they people, they didn't know what they were doing. You don't have any blacks who qualified to do it. But he pushed it through. And uh, he also then was a model because then the, the uh, mayors in Chicago, like Mayor Washington in Chicago, uh, Mayor Bradley in Los Angeles, they looked to Maynard basically to say, well, we need to emulate you know, what you're doing. And one of the most interesting pieces of data that I came across was the fact that when the airport was completed in 1980, near the end of the second term, 92% of all black airport work in contracting and services related, you know, you have all the stores and the advertising and stuff like that, retail and airports, large airports, 92% of all of this was in one place, Atlanta. In other words, take all the major airports, Los Angeles, Boston, New York, Chicago, Dallas, Houston, all of those combined, 8%. Atlanta, 92%. So I think you can see what an incredible impact he actually made on that. And they began to look to him, and he actually exported some of the folk, uh, like his chief administrative officer, to go into these cities to, in fact, help you know, these folks to do the right thing, to set up this joint venture project and do another thing. So that was very important. Another thing was, of course, dealing with the problem, which it's lessened now in many places, the issue of the police and police brutality. Uh, it was almost like a Saturday night regular thing for, in fact, crime and police brutality to occur on weekends. And there was a guy named John Inman, who was a police chief, who was, in fact, I guess, kind of a miniature Bull Connor. You've heard about him from Birmingham, you know, with the Civil Rights Movement and everything. Well, Inman wasn't too far behind. They had never convicted a policeman of a murder, second degree, first degree, or anywhere. And there were like, every year, there were maybe 40 or 50 black people who were killed by police. And so Maynard's thing now was not only to reduce crime, but to get rid of John Inman. And what Sam Massell did, since he was still licking his wounds over his defeat in the 1973 election, he decided that he would give Inman, after he'd been defeated, but before Maynard was sworn in in January, a five-year contract. Uh, John Inman was, uh, was Sam Massell Brothers Howard's poker buddy. That's how I got the position again. There was no civil service. There was no merit system. If John Inman liked you, you may be a major tomorrow. If he disliked you, you may be a beat patrolman the next day. Okay? Just like purchasing. No vendors, no competitive vendors, nothing you had to do. They went up and down depending on how he felt about them from one day to the other. So Maynard decided to deal with that. He said, well, the best way we can do this is, of course, through our reorganization of government, I'm going to create a Department of Public Safety under which police department and fire department will report to this commission of public safety. And he pointed one of his boyhood friends. They said that was cronyism. The only problem was that Reggie had not only been one of his chiefest political advisors, A. Reggie Lee, he was a lawyer. He had been in charge of the city jail. He had been deputy mayor of Boston, but yet he was just a crony. John Inman had a high school education. He never, he, when, 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 when Herbert Jenkins left after 30 years, Inman was, I think, uh, either a sergeant or a lieutenant. Well, he got, uh, Howard, his poker buddy, got the mayor of the cell to make him police chief. It's just unbelievable. Just no sense of having the skills or anything. He just did it. Well, you've heard of that. Chicago is a good example where you appoint your buddies because they're going to give you kickbacks or something like that. But the bottom line was, and it took him a time. Inman, of course, took him to court. 
said you can't do this, you can't basically uh, take away my position. He said, well, not. We're putting someone over you. And they gave him a broom closet as his office. And after five years of coming into the broom closet every day, he decided to take, uh, take retirement. But Reggie Eves managed to reduce you know, the crime and to basically eliminate police uh, brutality. Another thing that was a problem that we all you know, have been concerned about is, of course, the issue of drugs. And this was something that came up near the end of his second term. Uh, and as you know, it became even more pronounced uh, later in the drug wars, the young gangs, and things of that nature that were fueling basically the, the, the crime, fueling the shootings and things of that nature to the point that Atlanta became known as the murder capital of the world. I mean, murder capital of the USA, I don't know about the world. The bottom line here was that you had more people per capita killed in Atlanta during the years of like 677, 78, 79 than others. Detroit took that number one position a few years later, as many of you uh, probably know. But he did, in fact, set up a number of new innovative and creative things. The, you know, the beat patrolmen having precincts, you know, out in the, throughout the city. And he himself and his, uh, his police chief literally would walk around, you know, the city and make sure things were happening. He put extra patrol in the uh, public housing units where most of the crime occurred. That's where a lot of the young gangsters, uh, you know, hung out and that's where they sell, sold drugs and things of that particular nature. So dealing with that, you know, that particular problem. Another thing was the lack of citizen involvement in government. I think we can say that that's a problem that still exists to a certain extent. And he set up a couple of things that were unique as well, like Mayor's Day. In other words, uh, once a month, he had a day where citizens could just literally come into City Hall and talk to him. And it became so large that, of course, he had his, uh, his uh, uh, cabinet members to come down, and they would come in, and of course, they could speak to them directly about issues and problems in their particular uh, you know, uh, communities. And he was always out in the community. Uh, he was basically a 27, uh, 24, uh, 7 uh, mayor out in the streets looking at potholes, seeing what needed to be done, and in fact, you know, doing the quick fixes that were in fact, uh, you know, necessary. Uh, I'm going to sort of fast forward here uh, to his third term. Uh, he first two terms, 73 to, of course, uh, 81. Andy Young, he handpicked. Oh, that was one of the things about him. He was a very good, we wouldn't call him a boss, but he handpicked each one of his successors, okay? When he served two terms, he then handpicked Andy Young to replace him. And, uh, uh, and Andy served two terms, and then he came back in his third term. But when he came back in 1989, uh, there were probably the four most <laughs> difficult years of his life, because many of the <clears throat> problems that he was able to address then, the resources, the funds, were in fact no longer there. You know, in the 70s you had things like, like revenue sharing. Here you had money coming directly from the federal government down to the state, they could do things, you know, and uh, you know, they didn't have to you know, follow all these guidelines and stuff of that nature. That in fact was gone. The problem of affordable housing and homelessness was much more pronounced by 1990, as you know. Many of the Vietnam veterans, you know, were, had, had come back and they were also, of course, having problems. And then you had, of course, the Iraqi you know, war uh, beginning uh, you know, as well. But it didn't create that much. But the problem was that you had more and more people who were in need of those kinds of affordable housing services. They tried to get standing uh, senior single room occupancy, SROs built for folks. But a lot of the neighborhoods actually resisted having those kinds of facilities in their particular communities, black as well, you know, as white. So, because he didn't want to warehouse them like you do with public housing. You know, public housing in Atlanta and most major cities are kind of like gigantic, uh, uh, I guess you might say, storage places for poor people. They're usually out in the middle of nowhere. There are usually no good bus service nearby. And they're isolated. The kids go to the schools there. The schools are awful. You know, you're sort of almost setting them aside like I guess they used to do with lepers, uh, you know, in biblical times. They were basically banished in isolation and things of that nature. So he wanted to deal with that. He wanted to have these, but the problem line was in terms of affordable housing, you may remember that Ronald Reagan was in office in the 80s, and what did he do? He eliminated all additional, any new public housing. He in part was privatizing. Remember, they were setting Section 8 programs and things of that nature. Well, that basically uh, wasn't doing it. Uh, he also tried to deal with uh, the problem of transportation and traffic. 
Atlanta does have a mass transit system, but it's one of the worst ones, I think, in the country. You have a situation where I remember my mom came down, I was blessed to be able to retire, to live with us in, in Atlanta. And what happened was that she would be like a, what do you call it, candy stripe at the hospital, but she never learned to drive, of course, in New York. So the bottom line was she would take a bus from the house over to the transit station. She would ride the transit station, and then she'd have to take another bus to get to the hospital, Southwest Community Hospital. So what was a 10-minute drive became almost an hour by mass transit, if you want to call it that. It was awful. And the state, of course, refused. Atlanta Metro, the, uh, it's actually called MARTA, Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit System. It's the only major city in the nation that has mass transit that doesn't get one penny from the state government. There's nothing in the line item, nothing in budget. You go to Chicago, that's why they're so good. You cannot basically have mass transit without some kind of subsidy. So he was trying to deal with that. The business community, of course, was interested in building more roads through the city and things of that nature. It's the Department of Transportation, but it's really the Department of Highways. The mentality is in fact still there. Our Constitution prohibits the gas tax from being used for mass transit. So he was seeing these problems, people not only having problems with housing, but also having problems with, of course, mass transit and literally getting out to the suburbs, you see, because only two of the five counties actually supported it, funded it. And so you would have a situation where the suburbanites could come back into the city, but the low-income blacks, as businesses, the shopping malls and things like that, were outside on the perimeter, and they had no way of getting there. One of the big successes that he did, in fact, have was being able to attract the Olympics. And the Olympics, as you probably know, were in Barcelona in 1992, and a young man named Billy Payne, who was an all-American football player, he was also a lawyer, was one of the big five uh, law firms uh, down there, and Andy Young, who you may recall after uh, he was a congressman, he was a bastard, and he met, he knew and was good friends with just about all the third war nations. But to make a long story short, they actually went out and they won the Olympics. One of Maynard's major goals was, of course, to not only enhance Atlanta's position as the economic uh, motor of the South, engine of the South, but also to turn it into a national city and to transform it into an international city. And to a certain extent, that is exactly what happened with regard to the Olympics in terms of bringing people in. And we've had dozens of international businesses located in the Atlanta metropolitan area, and of course, throughout uh, you know, the state, uh, state of Georgia. But to a certain extent, that inability to deal with problems, he went in saying, Axon Jackson is back, and I'm in fact going to you know, deal with some of these problems that are not being, uh, not being uh, dealt with. But he was really uh, not very successful during his third term. Uh, going back to the buck, uh, he in fact became a very good investment banker in the interim period of his, uh, uh, between his two administrations. Uh, he in fact set up uh, Jackson Securities, uh, which actually became a very successful firm. But more importantly, he was always about service, so he actually set up the National Association of Securities Dealers, which was minorities primarily to try to get them into Wall Street, where you know a lot of money is made in investment banking, and some of it, of course, is made in a not too ethical manner. And <coughs> the way that things happen in the economy, of course, in the end of uh, 2008 shows that you know you need ethics uh, in uh, government in order to, and in private business in order to do things uh, the right way. But he did in fact do that. He also began to set up a number of organizations. When you talk about the, the ballot, we're also talking about the organizations he set up like the National Association of Black Mayors. The, uh, he became president of the National League of Cities. Uh, he also you know, became involved in a number of other uh, organizations as an official, as a, as a you know, vice chair or president or things of that particular nature. And that's when he began to become involved more in the higher education as well with the, you know, being on the boards uh, of trustees of a number of these uh, major, of these colleges and universities uh, in, the, in the center. And he also then decided that he wanted to become the chairman of the National Democratic Committee, uh, which was the last major political, uh, I guess, activity, uh, you might say, in terms of saying, well, he felt he could do more. He wanted to get, he said, we lost the election, you know, in 2000, not because of Gore's poor, I guess you might say, political decisions such as not allowing 
you know, President Clinton to go out and campaign in states where he was still popular, which was absurd, uh, to, to prevent him from doing that. Uh, and, and it was because we had not, what, registered our constituency, our base, Hispanics, African Americans to a great extent, because what? If in fact you lost just by a few votes in Florida, but you know how the electoral college distorts things, you probably could have won that if you would have spent more time and effort focusing on that uh, rather than trying to uh, bring over or recruit uh, people who are Republicans, for example, to try to vote for you. So he wanted to do that in order to sort of reorganize and revamp the Democratic National Committee. The only thing was, of course, is that President Clinton wanted what Terry McGall, the guy who had raised hundreds, well, I should say hundreds of millions, but tens of millions of dollars uh, for him. And of course, he was running up against a big wall. But Maxine Waters, congressman and his, I guess, campaign strategist in the DNC basically said, Maynard, you can't win it, but we can get a lot out of this. So what they did basically was to say, we need to have unity, and you need to have someone like a Maynard Jackson to be the number two person. And so they created a position uh, for him, and they gave him about $15 million to help build the gas roots up again so that in 2008 you wouldn't have the similar kind of, 2004, you wouldn't have the same kind of situation. And uh, his business, uh, after 9-11, began to have some problems. So he was elected to that position, but he quit a year later because he had remarried us, man, I skipped so much. And of course the situation was that he had children who were in what middle school and he couldn't wait until their senior year in college so he had to go back and try to make some money unfortunately for him he was at the uh the uh, afl cio uh and several other unions based in dc trying to raise money to establish his atlanta i mean his american uh, voters league in order to carry out what i mentioned he said we register more we're going to win uh you know next time and the bottom line here was that he was unsuccessful in doing the things in his last administration. But I think one can say, and I'm going to end here, and hopefully you will ask me several questions which I can bring out some more things about leadership. May I I'll just say this one, one, one quick thing. Uh, you know, the Greeks used to ask when a person died, uh, you know, did they live their life with passion and purpose? And I can't think one can say it in the case of Maynard Jackson, he did. And the question I would ask is, did they in fact leave the world better place than when they found it? And I would say that that answer is yes as well. I just want to talk about a few things in terms of uh, leadership, which I think is what it is necessary to deal with the crisis of the cities and the things that the mayors have to deal with. I think it's clear, have a mission that matters. I think Barack Obama sort of, as a presidential candidate, showed that. He was into something, he wanted to bring about change, and Maynard Jackson was that same kind of person. He viewed himself as a change agent who wanted to change the social, political, education, and economic uh, aspects of life uh, in Atlanta, and Barack Obama saw himself as doing that. So any mayor confronted with these various problems that I mentioned that are still there, mass transit, affordable housing, uh, economic development, and things of that nature, they have to have a mission, they have to have those priorities. Being a big thinker, you have to have a vision. What is it that you want to accomplish? You know, what is it that you want the world to be like that you can influence in the next five years, in the next 10 years, and then you gotta build building blocks step by step, you know, activity, resources and things to in fact make that vision a reality. A second thing is you have to be ethical. This is one of the fundamental problems, as you know, that we have seen not only in the urban areas, but throughout. In the federal government, state and local government, there are very few days that pass when you don't have someone who's being accused of some ethical misbehavior. I guess is the best way you know, to put it. And the problem is that you know, all of us have grandparents, they try to instill those things in us, do the right thing, uh, you know, and, and, and a lot of elected officials don't, but this is absolutely absurd. And that's why you know, politicians, elected officials are now, I always would tell my friends, though, I consider myself to be a statesman, not a, not a, not a politician. And the idea here is that you, know, you do those things that are ethically and morally correct, and that way you can have people, in other words, you lead by example, you know, when you're doing those ethical things. And be a change master, similar to, to number one. There are hard decisions that you have to make. You know, people benefit from the status quo. As I mentioned, with regard to the uh, business community and joint ventures, they just took the same position that Republicans took on, uh, on the healthcare. We don't 
want you to do anything but drop this nonsense and start all over. I mean, that, that's the attitude. So you're going to run into people like that. And they're going to be there. They're going to be battling you tooth and nail all the way. But you've got to think of yourself as being someone. Uh, one of the most important books I think has ever been written was a guy book uh, called Anatomy of Revolution by Crane Brent back in 1917. And he studied many revolutions, the Chinese Revolution, the uh, Egyptian Revolution, the Russian, you know, Soviet Revolution thing. And the one thing they all had in common, of course, was that they were risk takers, uh, they were change masters, and they felt that they wanted to transform society. And Maynard attempted to do that, and that's the kind of thing that you have to go in as a leader in urban areas to, in fact, deal with. Decision maker, you know, a lot of people like to sit on the fence. It's hard to make difficult decisions when you know there may be adverse political consequences to your particular action. You might alienate what your political base, you might alienate your uh, donors uh, through your campaign and, and, and things of that nature, but you have to be able to say that I'm willing to deal with and live with the consequences and I'm doing it, not because it's politically popular, not because it's political correct, but because it's the right thing to do. And uh, that, that's a very uh, difficult thing. Using power wisely. Uh, many of you are political scientists remember the old saying by Lord Acton, you know, about power corrupting absolutely, more power corrupts absolutely. Well, that in fact does happen. And that's one of the problems, and I think you can point to it at every level of government, national, state, and local, where many people <coughs> going with the idea of a great platform or wanting to do things, but then what? They try to use it for their own benefit. Or they go beyond what the Constitution or the city charter or whatever allows them to do. And they basically, you know, the charge made against George Bush about you know, how he was trampling the Constitution and decisions he made and things of that nature. So using power wisely is very important. You use it for the good, not for the bad, and not for your own personal self. Uh, the, the, the communicator, no leader can lead without being a great communicator, of course. I mean, the idea is you have to clearly, explicitly be able to what, present your particular ideas in order to get people to come who are willing to follow you. And so if you're not a good communicator, you're not going to be that. Team builder, coalitions, absolutely essential. One of the things that Maynard did when he ran for the first time, and the city of Atlanta at that time was still majority white. But he built together a coalition of African Americans, of uh, neighborhood leaders, of uh, the, the ministers, uh, you know, intellectuals, and, and a lot of other folks. And I think that's essential to, and that's what also Obama, you know, did. He had one of the most diverse constituencies in 2008 ever, you know, ever, ever, ever assembled. Be courageous and be committed. Those are things that uh, uh, are also absolutely essential. So uh, why don't I stop here and see if you have. Any questions about uh, uh, the crisis of leadership or how Maynard Jackson uh, did, in fact, serve as a role model, if you will, to trying to address some of these particular problems? Yes? Uh, I just have um, one question. Sure. I mean, with, with Alabama and Georgia and many of these southern states being extremely um, racially motivated as far as business, economically, yeah. or, um, socially as well, uh, it seemed that, you know, the mayor was more focused on uh, uh, um, getting the black franchises to, uh, uh, to prosper as well as the whites were prospering. Mm -hmm. But how was, how was he able to, to find such balance? Because in a sense, it, it, it seems as though he was the mayor for, much, for, for well, blacks, you know what I mean? And not well, that was keeping the, the balance in which, you know. Well, in see, his idea was that you, in fact, were you were going to keep the balance. He didn't say that he wanted all of the contracts. In other words, he didn't want to just uh, revert and say, well, whites have had 99.8%. Now blacks are going to have 99.8%. He didn't do that. The balance was, he said, given the current economic wherewithal, the capability of black engineers, then we'd, let's pick a reasonable goal. So remember, his goal was 70-30, because he recognized you had many large white businesses that have great capacities to build things, and that's why he wanted joint ventures in part, because when small black businesses joint venture with white large businesses that had been around for decades, then they could not only enhance their skills, but his idea was not that they would always be looking for government contracts, but they would also be able to get private contracts. In other words, if 
the banks that I mentioned, they got the money. If they could show that they could build buildings or whatever, then when they're building a new Citizens and Southern branch or a new trust company branch, why wouldn't they use them? They say, hey, we got a track record. We built this thing, it's good quality, it's on time, no cost over. So when you are thinking about it, why don't you also think about why contractors that now have a track record? So he wasn't, the balance was, yeah, 70, 30 seems reasonable, as I said, given the capabilities, given the size of black businesses and things. So he, that was his balance, that was his goal. Not to completely reverse it and say, well, you guys have had this for decades, now we're gonna take all of it except 0 0.0012. That was the balance, yes? I mean, I think you need to remember when this happened. It didn't happen last week or last month. It happened 10 years after the Voting Rights Act was adopted. It happened 11 years, or I think 11, after the, uh, the Civil Rights Act was adopted. It happened just a few years after people were beaten brutally by, by state and, and local police, people being white people as well as black people, but a predominant number of being black. So what he was able to accomplish in Atlanta in the early, in the early mid 70s was really remarkable. And he did it, it seems to me, correct me if you think my interpretation is wrong, by saying, I'm the mayor, I've got the power, I'm going to use it. The, the, the case of the Hartsfield Airport is particularly instructive yeah. um, that, you know, as you pointed out, he sat down with the, the, white, the white leadership and said, it ain't going to get built unless you play ball, which is the kind of politics that, that many political, effective political leaders employ. Obama employed that, employed that kind of politics uh, to, get, to get the health care. Well, that was a but I think yeah. but I think we have to we have to remember sure. that he did this at a time when what he was doing mm -hmm. was truly remarkable, yeah. and it was done in the deep south. Yeah. So it was about ninety percent of what he was doing was about race. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I, I agree with you in the sense at the time, and that's why I said he was a role model. You know, role models are people who, in times of adversity, what rise to the top. Their leadership shows and they, they're willing to take risks, they're willing to do things, like you said, he was called a lot of things, except the child of God, uh, for what he was attempting to do, and the bottom line was, that's what made, as I said, his uh, activities and his successes a very other, important thing. I can't thing. think of any other city in the South, with possible exception of New Orleans, <laughs> where a black leader was able to come forward uh, as he did. Well, remember, what I was saying about these things were that Many leaders, in fact, need to have these qualities, which means that, as I said, when you make controversial decisions, some people think of it, well, how will this help me or hurt me with my donors, uh, with other folk, uh, and will I lose votes, part of my coalition? But as I said, you have to think in terms of decisions, not whether they're politically popular, not whether they're politically correct, but whether they are right, and then be willing, like Dr. King said, to suffer the consequences, and he, that's what I think made him unique. A lot of guys were in the position, but they weren't willing to push, cajole, fight, and just draw that, the line. That, that takes us down the road of the great man theory, which, which, most, which most observers of politics don't accept. Well, it's not a matter of the great man, you look at it in terms of reality. You have to ask yourself. If you're a, a person who wins by a fairly small margin, and it's sort of like, you know, a candidate who's then worried, when I run for re-election, will this decision cause me to lose 5% of my constituency, which means I might lose the re-election? And that's the basis of their decision. Maynard's decision was what his grandfather instilled in him, what his daddy instilled in him, it doesn't matter the consequences. I'm gonna do what I think is right. Yes? I'd like to uh, talk a little bit more about the Maynard model being uh, exported. It seems to me from, from reading the book that Individuals like Harold Washington in Chicago, David Dinkins in New York, tried to adopt the strong-armed leadership model of Maynard Jackson and came up against the structure of the city council. And it seems from reading your book that those other individuals didn't learn from Maynard that you really can't do that when you have a very strong city council system. So for most of Harold Washington's term, you had the city wars. So I want to know simply, have black mayors learned the wrong lesson from Maynard Jackson and tried to approach their uh, mayorships as fiefdoms? Or are they more coalitional uh, in their outlook? 
for Irish, it's, it's, it's a little bit of both. Uh, and the thing about it is that, of course, the interview with every city is unique. The reason that it took later, basically all of his first term, to put things in place was because, one, the agency heads were holdovers. The, the guy who had been the commissioner of finance, Charlie Davis, he had been there 20 plus years. The guy who had been commissioner of planning had been there 20 years. Uh, the guy who had been the commissioner of, uh, of uh, I mean, law, I mean, he had been there 20 years. So he had to literally get these guys out before he could actually achieve his plan. He had, when he started, he had five of the 18 members of the city council who were African Americans, and he had a couple of what you might call liberal white uh, allies, but he still didn't have a majority. So it was trying, it was absolutely necessary to get, like the, as I said, the neighborhood folk to deal with the, the white, uh, uh, you know, councilmen who were obstreperous and were trying to block what he was trying to do. You had to also get, he did have a few business allies to try to get some of the folk to come around in the business community and say, hey, I mean, this is good for the city. The image that Atlanta have, of course, as the oasis of the South and the image that Birmingham had in terms of being the, uh, the most racist city was very significant to the white leaders because they said, if our image is tarnished to this extent, we may not grow and surpass Charlotte, which may have been kind of coming up on it, but they made bad decisions about the airport and things of that nature. So it's a combination. I think some of them did learn, some of them didn't. In the case of Harold Washington, as I said, he literally on joint ventures asked Art Cummings to come up there, and you know one of my former students, uh, uh, Ernest Bearfield, went up there as a deputy, you know, chief administrative officer, and then uh, his boss died, and Ernest became the chief administrative officer. Well, Ernest had been the deputy CAO in Atlanta before he went up there, so he literally exported to you know those mayors uh, the things that he thought would work. But as you know, everyone has to look at the political, economic, and other landscapes in their particular community to say, well, I need to tweak this, modify this, in order to get it. But he's right. Atlanta was unique, and Maine was able to do some things because eventually the business leadership was able to be brought kicking and stratting, I mean, just dragging <laughs> and kicking and screaming into saying, okay, if we're going to build this airport, which they knew was absolutely critical to Atlanta's, future as the economic center of the South, that it would have to give in. But remember what they did after he uh, left office? He couldn't get a job in Atlanta. He couldn't get a job in Atlanta. No law firm hired him. And when Sam Nunn leaves the Senate, he becomes a senior partner in King and Spalding, okay? Not one of them. And they, that was showing their dissatisfaction. He went up to Chicago and got a job with an investment banking firm and then talk them into setting up Atlanta regional headquarters. And for three years in a row, he was the highest selling person, just like with the, uh, the encyclopedias. And he made about $300,000 a year, which was a lot of money back in the, the early 80s. It's a lot of money now. But that was, that was the thing. So you know, each city is really different. Each one is a factor. I'll come back and let's see Are there any other questions? Uh, There must more be some. Don't, 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 be, don't be special. Yes. I have one question, Doctor. Sure. Your qualities of leadership, do you have them in, in order of importance? No, it was kind of stream of consciousness. <laughs> so, okay, you know, what, what does a leader have to do? But you almost have to put these first two first. Because what is the old saying? If you don't know where you're going, any road will lead you there. So you got to have that vision. You know, you got to have that futuristic kind of thing. Remember what Bobby Kennedy uh, you know, said in his, one of his famous speeches that, you know, he dreams of things, I mean, dreaming of things and saying, why? And he dreams of things and says, why not? And that was kind of the mentality that Maynard had. You know, he had this image of Atlanta basically being the model for the rest of the country. Uh, he wanted, a, a, you know, a, a uh, diverse group. I mean, when he was setting up his cabinet, I mean, he had more firsts in terms of women, black and white. I mean, the first female commissioner of the administrative services, uh, the first uh, 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 lawyer, you know, for, for the city, uh, and, you know, just a bunch of other things. You know, his chief of staff was a, was a female, and uh, he even set up an office of uh, gay and lesbian advocates or something like that. 
So I mean, his idea was to get the neighborhoods together, blacks together, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and just have this coalition and let everyone, you know, his, one of his saying was, you know, uh, you know, rising tide raises all ships. It doesn't always happen that way. It sinks a lot of ships if it rises too fast. And, and to, like the flood, you know, you want water, but it comes too fast, you know, you want it. But the bottom line was, I think, that these are some of the things, and they aren't necessarily exhaustive as well, but it seems to me that if you're going to be a successful, you know, leader, that these are some of the things that you have to manifest, you know, when you, in fact, uh, yes? Okay. You talked about Maynard being a role model now, and you talked about his father and his grandfather being yeah. role models in yeah. public service, but did he have any national role models, or did he have any role models that were mayors of other cities? No, remember, there were only a few black mayors before him. Yeah. Yeah. People like Richard Hatcher, uh, you know, 1967 in Carl Stokes, in Gary and Carl Stokes, you know, in, in Cleveland. So no, he really didn't have that. He was among the first group, sort of like the Tuskegee Airmen, you know, they didn't have any role models because they wouldn't allow blacks to fly in a plane. Who? Yeah. Made so he yeah. Did yeah. Apply it. yeah, well that that was the idea. But I think more importantly was the influence and experiences that he had with his father. See, Mr. Dobbs used to literally Mr. Dobb, when I say he was the mayor of Auburn Avenue, he literally was the unofficial mayor. Uh, and basically, people listened to him. As I said, he was also the Grand Master of Prince Hall, Mason. He was a national figure. Uh, he used to be a surrogate for Franklin Roosevelt in speeches on a national, national scale. He was a powerful individual at you know, the, na in the national level. And as I said, it's a sad thing. You talk about you know, black history, and as one writer said, it's been lost, stolen, or strayed. Oh, I just throw in this. It has nothing to do with uh, Have any of you seen the movie Top Gun with Tom Cruise? You know who was the original Top Gun in 1949? One of the Tuskegee Airmen? Colonel James Harvey. Doesn't look anything like Tom Cruise, does it? But that's what we have in many instances. And a lot of these folk uh, you know, have done a lot of things, and that's the reason I think they their story needs to be told and that people need to recognize how much they, how much impact they actually have had. And that's the reason I wrote the book, of course. But he was a personal friend uh, as well. We disagreed. And that was another thing they said about Maynard, that a lot of people were afraid. Well, he's six foot four, he weighed 300 pounds. Uh, but there were a few of us who disagreed openly, publicly, when he fired the garbage workers. I was out there marching against him. Uh, when he fired Reggie Eves because of an alleged cheating police scandal. I ran Reggie's campaign for, for county commissioner and Reggie won. When he tried to put in a sales tax and we showed him he could raise it and more than cover the budget when we set up the sales tax opposition panel. But he always endorsed me. You know, I've served for 34 years. We served run every two years in Georgia. I never asked him to endorse me. So sometimes, you know, you gain respect of people when you stand up. And he probably saw a mirror image, as I did when I saw him. We were both overhead. I posed the Speaker of the Georgia General Assembly, the longest serving speaker ever, and people said, you're crazy. That's how I became the first African American to serve on the Budget Committee, because I said, Mr. Speaker, why are there African Americans on the Budget Committee? And then four years, six years later, my colleagues and other urban legislators said, yeah, we need African Americans on. And since I was crazy enough to challenge him, said, well, Bob, you're the one, because they knew I was standing up for him. So sometimes you do things, my grandmama said, that's right. In the short term, it may not be. You think, well, I'll never be a committee chairman, I'll never be this. You oppose the speaker, Paul Murphy, speaker for 36 or eight years. I said, yeah, because I thought he was wrong. Thought, now I didn't know, but and she, my grandma said, I called her about it, it's really weird. I said, grandma, I said, look, I've got a very important decision I want to talk to you. My grandma was wise the first ever that never went inside of a school she was born during Reconstruction, okay? And I just asked her, I said, uh, you know, I know that it's gonna hurt me in this position, I'm a freshman. And basically, she said, well, what is it? So he said, well, I'm gonna oppose the speaker, I'm gonna support this opponent, right? And in my first term. And she said, well, do you think what he did was wrong? I said, yeah. I said, do, what, do you think what you're doing is right? And then she wondered, well, why did you call me? <laughs> you know what you did. And that's how I try to uh, follow. That's the 
ammunition I followed in my career to do what's right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have some uh, cookies and uh, juice and water over there. So uh, we can talk some more uh, sure. over there. Thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you. I, I enjoyed it. Really? Okay. Thank you.